even on the first ball we did, we were like relatively minor cart path damage. If anything. We were like, whoa. It was significantly more impactful than I expected. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode number 95 of No Putts Given. I'm Miranda, and I'm here with Tony, Harry, and Chris. And Chris, who are we giving a head cover to this week? Hey, I had a guy that reached out last week, uh, said something like, man, I love those Japanese head covers. And I said, hey, send me your address. I haven't heard from him yet. So this one is back on the block. Did our mailbag guy reach out? Did I say his name right? Uh, Don't know. I haven't heard from him. Okay. Don't know, but this is the year of the rat. <laughs> For some reason that you deserve this head cover, and I'll pick one, and, and it's yours. I'll send it to you. If you rat it on your mate or something like that to get him in trouble, Ooh. then that head cover's for you. Okay. Ah. Yeah, that's good because the next week's one is called Gear of the Asshole. And so yeah, we- Tony, <laughs> that's you. That's also applicable. <laughs> I really want to see the design of that one. <laughs> <laughs> Miranda's uh, just gonna just disconnect today. <laughs> you're fine. Sometimes you're funny, and this was wonderful. So. <laughs> oh wow! Wow! <laughs> All right. So we are still getting new information from the ball test that we went did what two months ago in July. Yeah. So it's been a, a few months, and we're still churning some data to get new information for for all of you guys. And one of them is the effect that what is your fancy word that you say, Tony? Aerodynamic disruption. Yes. So. Translating that means mud on your ball, scuffs from the cart path, dents, dings, that sort of thing, and what effect it has on ball flight. So that article went out last week. But Tony, why don't you give us a quick synopsis? Yeah, so I mean, the the big takeaway from this, whether it's mud on the ball, whether it's a scratch, a gouge, whatever you happen to have, it's going to cause the ball to move in the opposite direction of the aerodynamic disruption. Damage. Yes, thank you, Chris. <laughs> Which means if the scuff or crapness is on the left-hand side, it's going to move right and vice versa. And again, depending on sort of how far to the left it could be, hey, the ball just happened to end up where it's pointed the scuff, the mud is perfectly downrange. That's going to have obviously a different implication than if your, your mud, your scratch is effectively, you call it 90 degrees from your impact. So kind of the farther away from that that point of impact the more it's likely to impact ball flight and also the greater the disruption right a minor scratch probably not going to have too much of an implication very minor scratch because some of what harry and i found during testing certainly surprised us Mm -hmm. and then bigger scratches are going to have much more significant implications but you're telling me that it can be mud on the ball or a scratch in the paint or anything else and it flies almost the same Yeah, I don't necessarily want to say scratch in the paint because typically like missing paint isn't a big deal. But think about like a cart path. Think a cart path stuff. Once once you're sort of disrupting the dimple pattern is a good way to think about it, right? Am I doing something that interrupts the continuity of the dimples? Is it removed dimples? Is it kind of shaved down the edges of the dimples? That kind of thing. When you get into that, that is what's going to cause the problem. And, you know, well, you can talk about some differences in ball flight. Between, say, scuffs and, and mud, the, the ultimate implications are the same. And, and to a degree, it, very, it works very much like an off-center core as well, where you just have a, a shift in the spin axis at impact, right? The airplane wing. So your ball is going to tilt hard at impact. It's going to tilt opposite the, the direction of the issue. And, you know, depending on the severity, it's, it's either going to go a little offline or a lot offline. And as part of that offlineness, you're going to lose distance, and and very often, if it's severe enough, you will see some trajectory differences as well. Now, this is this is all based on a robot hitting these shots. So when a robot hits these shots, obviously it's trying to be as square as possible. So if you potentially have a into out swing and hit a draw, and the mud is on the right hand side of the ball, you could see a lot more left side tilt potentially. Yeah, depending on on how you deliver the club and and what sort of factors you're introducing, you can either exacerbate the issue or you can mitigate it to a degree. And it was kind of funny, like, 
you know, we're not the only ones that that sometimes see our comment section and laugh. I actually got a, a text <laughs> yesterday from from somebody in the uh, in the industry who was kind of like shaking his head at some of the comments too, and and I joked. I said, you know, I'm actually kind of this close to writing a story on on how you can use mud to mitigate a slice off a of tea, and so like you know, theoretically, you you absolutely could do that. <laughs> so there's just lots of interesting stuff for sure. I don't know if we actually tested this. I can't remember. It was such a long time ago now. But July? <laughs> yeah. I mean, so much shit has happened okay. since July. If the mud is on top of the ball, you know when you hit a ball and the wind knocks it down a little bit? It's the same kind of thing. So it gets up, but it comes down real quickly. So, uh, But it could be one that has less spin. So 1,500 revolutions of spin, which really just struggles to get up in the air and just falls out the sky, is what we... Yeah. So yeah, we definitely saw like in those cases, we didn't dig too much into it when in the write up, yeah. um, but because we didn't have the opportunity to test in that orientation quite a bit. So the way that we did this, we kind of, you know, did a couple shots where we tried to replicate basically identical damage. And then we started trying to make it progressively worse. And we did mm -hmm. we did some crazy shit we didn't even talk about in the in the article. What like did I you actually. Do? I actually took a blowtorch to a ball and basically burned off half the dimples. Did you, okay, why did you have a blowtorch? Where did you I, obtain said blowtorch and how did you get it to Arizona? So we were in the in the robot area and we we're looking literally looking for for ways to create and replicate damage. So there were some effectively like bricks that we were able to use to replicate a cart path and they had a die set so I could kind of scrape away at some stuff and I'm digging through the drawers and there's a blowtorch. And so this is where Tony's eyes just lit up because he was like, oh, fire. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, let's just burn the cover off in this. Area. What type of damage are you trying to replicate with a blowtorch? Like, well, it was in what scenario do I like, oh, shit, I burnt off half my golf ball. There was actually a purpose to it. To a Please degree, tell right? us. It's so we didn't, again, we don't have time. We don't have precision. We can't manufacture during the test. We were kind of right at the end of it. And so. When you go to and you take a tour of the the ball plant and Titleist Manchester Lane facility, one of the things they show you is, you know, kind of a what happens when there's uneven dimpling on a ball or even a ball that's missing dimples. And so I was like, well, let's let's see if I can use this blowtorch to effectively more or less smooth out the ball. And, you know, just I like I, melt the dimples. Away. Just yeah, melt it. Pretty much. Yeah. And so I didn't accomplish it perfectly. But, you know, we did. That was another one. Again, it's not it's not realistic damage, but it was one of those things that allowed us to confirm that as you progressively d lose dimples, if you will, or increase the amount of aerodynamic disruption, even wilder and wilder stuff happened. And, and also having that blowtorch made it super easy for me to get the cover off when we we hit the ball with no cover whatsoever, which is also impractical. See, the scientist in you finds a blowtorch and says, <laughs> okay, what can I learn from this? The journalist in me is like, why is there a blowtorch here? And I see the blowtorch and I'm going, that's for creme brulee. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's kind of funny, too, because at first I'm like holding the ball and just blow torching it. And <laughs> Harry's like, what the hell are you doing? And I'm like, you know, I, believe it or not, I've actually done this before. It's fine. Oh, like, this yeah. is, Everyone calm down. This is, yeah. <laughs> if you're not an expert, do not go uh, no, ahead and don't. use a blow torch to try and get the cover off. Do not do that. So question for you. Based on seeing all of that stuff and knowing this goes back to the range ball thing a little bit. Don't get fit with the range ball, whatever. If I'm going out to get ready for a round of golf or whatever... Would it be fair to say, like, I know, like, in the spring, you know, sometimes they roll out the brand new range balls and they look good for about a week or two. And then, you know, they get gathered times. up by the machines <laughs> and, and inevitably they get some type of, uh, you know, external, you know, whatever deformation, whatever you said it was. Disruption, aerodynamic Aerodynamic disruption. disruption. I myself am an aerodynamic disruption. <laughs> but should I even care? Like if I'm going to warm up, maybe I should just hit balls, take swings and not even care about ball flight. Well, that's how I do it for the most part. I just use it just to warm up and get loose. I don't really take into account, hey, I'm hitting a fade today or a draw today or whatever, really, unless the ball is like brand new. I do not look at my trajectory i do not look at dispersion or anything like that i really just get there to warm up you're like oh man i was hitting it so bad on the range today or oh i was hitting it really good well maybe you weren't actually doing either my whole thing on a range is i'm i'm like all right was that quality contact 
and you have to allow that you know, yeah. some of these balls yeah. are are beat to shit some are missing dimples some of them kind of sat in dirt and are at the point where there is enough you know sort of dried mud in the dimples that- organic material right you have org- enough organic <laughs> material to create an aerodynamic disruption there it is. <laughs> yeah so i mean don't sweat that yeah. But I would say kind of the thing that, that really surprised Harry and I, even on the first ball we did, we were like, yeah, this this looks like relatively minor cart path damage. If anything. Yeah, when a, when a robot had it hit basically a perfectly straight ball, plus or minus a little bit of wind on the, on the previous shots, all of a sudden hit this big kind of hook that wasn't the kind of thing that would have been out of bounds, but even, even on a little bit with a little bit of scratch, you know, we saw like that, I think 10 to 12 yards offline. Uh, where you know the previous shots were plus or minus two we're like whoa and then we did a little bit more damage to the balls and it was like holy shit like this was it was it was significantly more impactful than i expected for for what was you know starting with minor and increasing to moderate damage and then by the time we started doing really crazy shit and you know literally sanding dimples off uh, half of the half the ball or quarter of the ball or a blowtorch, um, maybe. Yeah, it was it was absolutely wild to see. You know, it was reminiscent of, of what you know Sam and I saw in the first ball test when we we had balls that we later found out had significantly off center cores, where it's just like, what the hell just happened? Because again, you know, like we know what that robot is doing. Would you take a ball out of place sooner now? today than you mm-hmm. would have before this yes. i absolutely yeah not only would i i have and so just the other day i was playing and i hit a, a crisp shot out of a bunker and yeah uh, you know what i actually went to putt and there was enough of a, a surface disruption where i could you know it was like my fingernail was catching on it I'm yeah. like yeah that that's that's out of play right now and that goes into my shag dag for um just chipping around the greens and stuff yeah. yeah. So I think there are a couple of lessons or pieces of advice that we can give to average golfers listening that we learn from this. One of them might be, hey, if you have mud on your ball, you know, mid round, how do you mitigate? You know, what do we know about where it's going to fly depending on where the mud is? The other one is there is a certain level of damage that does affect your game. Yeah. And I would say, because you mentioned mud balls again, um, and Matt, if you could throw up a link here, ping has an awesome article in their Proving Ground series about the effect of, of mud balls. They tested at a little bit different distances and we did some variation in that. But again, the the sort of the big picture takeaway is, you know, what they saw is exactly what we saw when we did it. I believe the the actual article is titled The Science of Mud Balls. If you want to dig deeper into that and understand that, that you know, many of the same implications are true for for scratches and and kind of significant to moderate to significant surface damage as well. There's there's probably something you can take away there. My biggest takeaway from that is to pay more attention to it. Like honestly, it's not something I've paid a lot of attention to over time. Like if the ball is absolutely trashed, it gets a cut from hitting a tree or something. It's like okay, that's obvious, right? But I'm more likely to go okay. I'm going to keep playing that ball until I lose it. Well. If you're going to lose a ball, you might as well lose it fast, which means take it out of play, right? Like it was making me think of, I can't remember, I think it was during our Scott Fawcett podcast. If you're going to hit it out, do it as soon as possible. Yeah, if you're going to hit it out of bounds or you're going to hit it in a hazard or penalty area, statistically, you're better off to do that sooner, as soon as you can in the hole, right? Like, and so it's like fail fast and yeah, because that ball probably eventually is going to cost you a full shot. It could be a part of a shot or whatever the case is at some point. And so if you notice those things, it doesn't feel good to go, Jesus, $4 ball is now I feel like it's a $3.92 ball and now I got to take it out. You know, like I feel like I'm being wasteful. But I think that's what I really like Harry's idea around the shag bag is, hey, take that, get a shag bag of stuff. So we were going out chipping and, and putting or whatever, and you got some good balls to practice with. It's not like you got to get rid of the ball. Just use it for something else. Yeah, And conversely, the strategy element here, right? If, if you do have a damaged golf ball, particularly off the tee where you're allowed to do whatever, you know, pretty much place it however you want, and you fight a slice... Take that damage and put it, <laughs> point it right at yourself. Like that's, you know. That was sort of my next question. So like Harry, say you have a, a bad shot and you hit the cart path or it's a particularly rainy day and you see mud. How do you approach it to know how to play the ball? I mean, that's a very loaded question. Can you give me a Reader's Digest? Sure. Uh, basically, okay. <laughs> when I look at a ball, 
It all depends on how much mud you have on it, the consistency of the mud, and the location of the mud for just a mud ball, for instance. And then what club you're having. So nine times out of ten, you're not going to have mud on on your driver. If you I would hope work. it's more than nine times out of ten. Of its... Well, there's a lot of golfers out there just don't give a shit. Yeah, don't yeah. be lazy. Don't be lazy with that. I would say the drivers are relevant, but when you start getting into irons, so the longer irons are going to react a little bit more like a driver because you it's a longer shaft. You're going to hit a lot more ball speed into it than you would do a lob wedge. And I've had mud balls before on the left-hand side of the ball, and I know it's going to the go to the right with a, say, a 60-degree wedge or a 50-degree wedge. It doesn't move as far off a line because it's taken into account the loft of the, the wedge, the spin, and then the potential consistency of the mud. So that the mud could, as soon as you hit it, just splatter off and you might be fine. So a mud is a little bit unpredictable depending on what type of mud it is, how much there is on there, and how much you do, because you, you can't clean it unless it's lift clean in place when then you're good. So it is a little bit more like a guessing game, but you can say, all right, it's definitely going to move the opposite direction of where the mud is. And then you have to take into account the slope of the, the grass. So say you're up on a, up on a upslope and the mud is on the right. Well, now it's going to move a lot more to the left than normal because you, it, the, that is promoting a draw anyway. So there's so many different factors that you have to take into account into one bloody shot. And this is just one shot. You could have exactly the same <laughs> shot next time. It's a bit of a process, but you have to do it if you want to play consistent golf. I'm sensing a new dinger video. Ooh. Yeah, the, the yeah. thing that was kind of interesting, and you know, we saw this, and again, the Ping article references exactly the same thing that... You know, and I think they probably put more effort into really caking the the mud onto the ball than we did. Um, the reality is, like it, it, the the overwhelming majority of the mud is going to fly off the mm -hmm. ball at impact. And so, you know, what you do is kind of get that that sudden spin axis tilt. And now, as Harry said, right, there may be cases where you do get more mud that sticks to the ball, and then now you're getting sort of, hey, I've got that that spin axis implication, which is going to cause the ball to curve opposite the side of the mud. And also now I've got some stuff clogging up my dimples, if you will. So in flight, that's going to cause some instability as well. So, you know, if, if you're playing lift clean in place, take advantage of it. I guess that's, you know. We'll and wrap it up, bud. And wash your f***ing face, Miranda. I know. <laughs> right? God. Jeez. And if you're playing a match play event and somebody else scuffs their balls and you look at it, you go, ah, I don't think that's that bad. You should be good to go. <laughs> Little match play tip. Yeah, Exactly. So some really cool information in there. Here's a link if you want to go take a look. We put this article out last week. We also put out our iron satisfaction survey results. Some of you probably took that survey for us, and we thank you very much for it. But, Tony, the iron satisfaction results mirrored driver results in a lot of ways, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we saw a lot of the same things, and I guess that, that shouldn't be surprising. Kind of big picture general takeaway. Better golfers are typically still happier with their equipment. Um, there is a correlation to dollars spent on happiness. Golfers who are fitted for their clubs are happier than those, are more satisfied than than those who are not. So, you know, we, we saw that in both surveys. And like I said, shouldn't be totally surprising. There are some things now we can we can start to point to as predictions of satisfaction, oh. predictors of satisfaction. What about specific brands or clubs or irons? Anything stand out? Yeah, the two things... I guess there. The first is we saw largely a repeat of of what we saw in the driver satisfaction survey, and you know Cobra was a little bit of an outlier as as, as the brand that golfers were least satisfied with, and you know we can talk about why that may be, but certainly saw like the leading brands on the market, TaylorMade and Callaway, had some of the least satisfied customers as well. I think that probably traces to the fact that if we look at fitting versus not fitted, these are also the brands that are brought, bought most often off the rack. So I, I don't think that's necessarily a reflection of TaylorMade and Callaway as it is of, of fitting versus non-fitting again. And then I think probably if you're going to say there's a huge surprise here when we look at overall customer satisfaction, right? The net promoter score, the mm -hmm. how likely are you to recommend to friend or colleague? The, the highest rated brand for that metric was, was sub-70, uh, direct-to-consumer brand. And again, we saw this in the ball survey as well, where, where brands like Snell and Vice were, were rated more highly for that metric than, than Titleist and TaylorMade and Callaway. 
And I think there is sort of an element of sort of, you know, supporting the little guy and being brand loyal, that sort of thing. And and then the case of Sub 70 in particular, if there's if there's one thing that we know about this brand that we've heard from Sub 70 buyers over and over and over again is the customer service, the accessibility. They kill it. The fact that yeah. you can you can pick up the phone, call and speak to the owner of the company. I mean, that's standard business practice. And so I think that level of access, that level of comfort, that that personal relationship, if you will, ultimately leads to higher satisfaction totally regardless of performance. And I'm not saying sub-70 irons don't perform well, but I'm saying it's, it's probably less a piece of the equation. And what I would point to to kind of support that is, you know, a couple of years ago, I stumbled upon this, this weird sort of statistic that said that patients who like their doctors, if you know, like them on a personal level, are less likely to sue them for mistakes than they are for doctors that they don't necessarily like on a personal level and so could see why which is something you definitely don't get from big brands like i get it is is i guess what i would what i would say there chris what do you make of some of the results i heard cobra not doing very well from a satisfaction standpoint you're a cobra guy you like cobra i you know and 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 the thing that's interesting is on the metalwood side in particular i'm a big fan of of what they've done historically and i feel like they push the envelope in terms of real technology and meaningful innovation. They probably don't get enough credit for a lot of the really cool things that they do in in that regard. You know, on the iron side with this specifically, I wasn't surprised. Well, I was pleasantly surprised, I guess, to see kind of where Mizuno and Strixon mm-hmm. fell out. Again, before my golf spy, before all this stuff, like, you know, just looking at it from a consumer standpoint, I think... Those two companies in particular, A, they do a phenomenal job with their irons. They've branched out in, you know, in terms of not just irons for better players, which is really historically more where Mizuno was with its MP line, etc. But what they've done with JPX in the last three, five years since the, well, I guess the, the orange EZ850 that we all want to forget. I was going to say the <laughs> JPX EZ debacle. Yep. Nobody <laughs> wants to uh, rehash that, but really say, uh, hold that off here in the parking lot for a second. Other than that, their JPX line has really, really served the needs of a wide swath of golfers. And I, they've, they've knocked it out of the park with that. And you have Strixon on the other side. And again, you know, because of, uh, I think, some of Strixon's organizational structure, they don't necessarily promote themselves as much as I think they deserve to. I know Harry plays the Strixon irons. I've historically played Mizuno irons. I hold those two companies up at the very top of what I think an iron company should do and should provide for buyers from an end product standpoint. And so Well, and I think our readers do as well because anytime the iron most wanted is coming around, you've either got the Strixon diehards or the Mizuno diehards and yep. both of them claim that the irons that they play should be at the top and for various I think legitimate reasons. Absolutely. So I was glad to see those do so well. I wasn't surprised to see some of the bigger names not do as well because of what Tony's alluding to, which is, you know, if I go to a big box store, I'm, I'm buying lottery tickets. We've said this before. Yeah. You shouldn't be surprised if you're going in buying lottery tickets and a lot of the tickets are losers, right? Because that's the odds are uh, just against you, regardless of what company you're buying. And is it more likely that someone's going to buy Strixon, Mizuno, whatever is, is going to go through that process and get fit for it? If so, that's helping take a good, really good product and make it even better, whereas opposed to you're taking maybe a good product and invariably making it worse by your method of purchase. And so totally agree with Tony. I think that's a huge facet to understand that, yes, it's an iron satisfaction survey, but you can't divorce that from the method of purchase uh, component to it. There's probably some brand awareness problems as well, that if you're a buyer going into a big box store, you're obviously aware of the Callaways and the TaylorMades and probably less aware of Strixon and Mizuno. Yep. Well, you see Mizunos in those big box stores. You very rarely see Strixons in those big box stores. Mizuno is, it it remains fascinating to me uh, because, and it's like, this goes back to every survey we've ever done. And and when I say every survey we've ever done, I mean, going back (laughs) 10 years in today's market, Mizuno is plus or minus a couple percentage points, 10% of the market. And that's reliably a number. For irons. Yes. For, yes. For irons. 
in our surveys, when we say, what brand are you playing? What brand of irons did you purchase most recently? Among my Golf Spy readers, my Mizuno is plus or minus 20%. So literally 2x of their market share among our readers. So, you know, that one, that one continues to fascinate me and, and just sort of like, you know, what is it? I think it's linked to performance because they, they, they do well in most wanted testing. They do. Correct? They traditionally do. And our readers pay attention to most wanted testing in the data. So I think that makes perfect sense as to why we would have a heavy contingent of Mizuno players. And I think they do as much as we focus on Mizuno as a player's iron, because uh, that's traditionally what they've been. And you know, at, at points in time when they've tried to be a game improvement iron, it's been shit. Uh, JPX easy, right? That's just sort of like the textbook Oops. example of, of what not to do, especially if you're Mizuno. You know, I talk about like the hot metal right now. When somebody comes to me and says, hey, I, I need new irons and you sort of talk to the guy and figure out you're probably a game improvement guy. Like hot metal is always on the top of my list. It, it has been just- JPX forged? Yeah, for me, it's the hot metal and then the Strixons ZX5s. I know that's technically in the player's distance category, but it has the shape of a, a game improvement on the longer irons for me. This is this may be criminal for me to admit, okay. but I, I am love you know, because I'm removed from the facility. I, I don't I don't necessarily get to try all the gear. I haven't hit a Shrix on iron in in years. So, ooh, Harry, what do you think? But that is that is like one of these word of mouth He's ones. Dead where, to me. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> it's just one of those things. Yeah. Well, then it sounds like you need to come make a trip. We haven't seen you in the facility. I've been working here for a while and haven't seen you in the facility. Tony visits once every decade, so you may have missed okay. the last one. Yeah, yeah. No, he's like the census. <laughs> I think yeah, twenty twenty nine. I'm I'm due like twenty twenty nine. Maybe we'll see. <laughs> okay, well, take a look at the Iron Satisfaction Survey if you're in the market for new irons. Even if you're not, um, some in interesting information there. We'll put a link for you. Put me. What are you eating? That's your dad's chocolate. He's going to kill you. Come here. What? Is that like your prized possession, Harry? Your chocolate? Yes. And I just come back from England, so I stocked up for like four years. Oh, so it's like bad chocolate. All right. I need to send you some like galaxy chocolate. What? It's out of this world. Oh boy. Here we go. Harry, send me some galaxy chocolate and I will send you yeah. a Japanese <laughs> head cover. <laughs> Can I get a better one than that? That one looks sure. terrible. I wish I wish they'd sent you some mallet covers as I am now a mallet guy. Yeah, what? that's true. I You're a mallet, mallet guy? guy? Yeah. yeah. What happened? I stole a putter from TaylorMade because it worked. Which so, one? Does TaylorMade know? A spider Shh, something don't. or other. Like that's that's what it like I don't even know what it is. Yeah, it was one of these things where I wasn't putting well the first day at Band and I was talking to their putter guy and he's like, What's the loft? And I'm like, I play one and a half, one degrees. He's like, Yeah, that's not gonna be enough for this grass. You need he's like you know, try one of ours and if you like it, go, you know, play with it today. And so I grabbed one of theirs. I liked it. I played with it. And then I'm like, you know what? This is mine now. I did. I'm not <laughs> giving it back. It's mine now. <laughs> Based on the transitive property of shit I just made up. This is hey, mine. Possession is <laughs> nine tenths of the law, dude. Did you, is so. it a face balance? Slight, slight <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a face balance mallet. Is like, it? So, it's wild. Wow, you've got the strongest arc possible, right? I know. Yeah, it just goes to show you. Yeah, your putting stroke is like a door hinge. You yeah. know, like it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Tony, what time is it? Mailbag! There we go. Okay, I've got a good question today. Um, I'm going to amend it a little bit. Eric Michael, thank you for having a nice, easy name to pronounce. <laughs> hey, Eric. Wants to know... <laughs> what's the best club driver through putters that has come out of your testing that would help most golfers? I'm going to amend that and say, what is one club in however long you've worked here, you take most wanted into consideration if you want to, don't if you don't want to, what is one club that you would never allow to leave your bag? Harry, why don't you go first? Hmm. Uh, it's recently then. Because uh, I actually spoke to Tony and said, I'm going to buy every single TSI 3 driver head that I can lay my hands on. Because that is, for me, the best driver I've ever laid hands on since playing golf. And that's, that's since I was 11 years old. They really just did something special with this driver. And they've always been spinny, in my opinion. They've always spun just that little <laughs> bit too much for me, personally. It didn't go that far. But whatever they did with this driver it is so consistent if i hit a good one it's in and around two thousand to 
2100 RPMs. And then if I hit a bad one, it's about 26 to 27. So I'm losing maybe five yards plus or minus a couple, but it's still within the same vicinity. It's just a phenomenal driver. It really, really is. And you figured out that you were fit into a TSI 3 by looking at our most wanted, team, yes. correct? Yes, because, I mean, I, it felt good. I loved the numbers when I saw it. But then when, when I said, all right, Tony, tell me what it is. I'm in the mood for a new driver. And <laughs> he goes, well, your most forgiven one is Tyler's TSI 3. Huh, your longest one is your TSI 3. And then your straightest one is a TSI 3. All right, well, it's not a fucking brainer. I'm going I'm, to... <laughs> I have to have it now. I mean, This isn't was, hard. Yeah. And that never <laughs> happens in our testing. But everything just correlated into this one mother bitch. <laughs> it was just, <laughs> and that was a TSI 3. That's actually the first name they considered for TSI yeah, 3. Yeah, I know. Somehow bitch. it didn't make it through. Yeah, <laughs> TSI <sure>. mother bitch. <laughs> I know a guy over there who might push for something like that. <laughs> yeah, I really. like it. I like it. All right, Chris, what's the one club that is not allowed to escape your bag? You said club, so I can't give my first answer. Um, so, what? But now I'm curious. Uh, titles golf balls. Oh, and boring. Yes, okay, club. Sorry. Club, even roll putters. Hmm. Specifically the two. When we look at that blade testing category, it's arguably the best putter we've ever tested in that particular head shape. So when you look from a stroke... What putter are you using now? It's a rotational situation. <laughs> so it doesn't it's, work. It does, it does escape your bag. You it let does, it out. I, because putters have a different type of relationship, it's organic. They need to understand if they don't perform well... They have to go in timeout. I do yes, get yes. It's different than any other club. <laughs> in the bag because there's a personal relationship that I have with with that. So that one and there's an Adele putter that very very similar setup, very uh very similar but fi- figuring out what works for me on putting and what doesn't and why and really found a lot of that out through a lot of the Adele putting uh putter testing and and just through our putter testing. That was the first answer that came to mind when he asked the question. Okay. All right, so unless it's in timeout, Chris is playing an even roll putter. Tony, you've been smiling and smirking this whole time. <sighs> yeah. What's it's... your answer? What's not allowed out of your bag? Any answer I give you is going to be bullshit because <laughs> it's going to come out of the bag sometime within. I know, and that's yeah. why I love this question. Potentially, potentially minutes, certainly within months. <laughs> so you want to talk about, hey, you know, sort of things you have a strong affinity to and haven't completely let go of. I, I would think about like a G400 LST driver, okay. but I don't play it. Yeah. It's out of the bag. I love the TSI-4. Is it in timeout or it's, is it done? No, because I'm obliterating the TSI-4 today, but... Tomorrow? You know, but <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm pretty sure like TaylorMade and Callaway are going to have some new stuff next year that I'm going to want to look at. So these are realities. And so... Uh, There's two ways to approach it. What what do I feel like I'm least likely to swap out anytime soon? It's it's the Ventus black shaft in my driver. That's that's exactly what I was going to say. If you want to say, hey, what is because you churn over more than the average golfer because you're you're a nut job schizophrenic kind of thing, then, you know, what is the longest standing club in my bag? We'll go with that. Then it's a PXG Gen 2 hybrid. So oh. interesting. How long? Okay. How many seasons? Two? Uh, I think I think it's probably season three. Ooh, that, yeah, no, it's like we're bordering on, on record territory. And I actually carry two of them. I carry the the four and the five hybrid. And it's kind of like a little off topic here, but I was joking with Adam yesterday. Everybody's kind of focused on on irons and, and how often you hit them and their impact on scoring. And I'm like, I sat back and I'm like, I would venture to say that I, in my home course anyway, where I'm very often either driver hybrid or driver wedge, that I, I hit more drivers off the over the course of a round than, than I do iron shots. And he's like, you mean like a seven iron, individual iron? I'm like, no, no. Like, no, I, like- I hit my driver more than I hit anything in my entire set of irons. And then I was like, I step back and I'm like, but you do have to consider that I only actually have four irons in my bag. So it's a little different than the average guy who carries seven. Yeah, you have like six head covers in your bag. Four yeah. of those are wedges. <laughs> so. Well, that's, yeah. So, I mean, my my iron set is is currently six through nine. You're like so. the eternal bachelor 
that everybody tries to set up over the course of his life, and you're just like, no, I'm I'm staying single. I'm not committing to anything. I got cats. In real life, you're married and happy and with a kid, but when it comes well, yeah, to golf, that's right. you're you're in the real. eternal bachelor. <laughs> I'm committed inside the walls of these house, but if you you know you get me out on a golf course, I'm a whore. Like that's just, <laughs> <laughs> like, and, everything and anything. And, you know, and the like, reality is, right, Tony, you can't be a part time whore. You're either That's in right. or you're out. Like, there, this ain't no part-time work. Revolving door, man. <laughs> like I said, a TSI-4 may stick because that was sort of like an accidental success story. You know, there was, that was that was put in the bag as a joke. Like, I'm going to take this low hit, low spin head and on this super low spin shaft, and I'm going to go out there and hit knuckleballs one day while I'm waiting for some something else to come in, and ha, 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 that'll be the end of it. And Wasn't yeah, the end no. of it. Yeah. Best driving year of my life. What are you going to do? So we've gotten we've gotten Ventus Black, we've gotten TSI four as an answer. What else have we gotten here? PXG Gen two. PXG Gen, Gen two okay, hybrid. So All right, that's not bad in no. terms of how many answers I usually get. Where is that? I did mention the Ping G four hundred too. Yep, so. you did. Yeah. Oh yeah, you did. Okay. So all right. One day, Tony, when you have an answer to this question, I don't care where we are in our lives. I need Stop. you to call me and let you me know. It'll be. I, I will call you. And be like Miranda. It turns out I have fifteen minutes to live. Um, so this is <laughs> yeah. this is we're done. <laughs> this is just what happened to be there when we ran out of time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah. So that there eventually one day will be a bag that doesn't change. Yeah. Bury me with that shit, and then every year <laughs> dig me up and put new stuff in. <laughs> <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> No, thank you. Harry, you win that game for having one lifetime love. Thank you. What do I get? A head cover? A head cover. Okay. Yes. Let us know in the comments what your one club that you'd never let escape your bag is. Or are you like Tony, you're an eternal bachelor or bachelorette. Let us know. All right. On that note, we out. We have been getting questions about the GC3 for weeks, and we finally have answers. Do you mean the Bushnell Launch Pro? I mean both. Is it the same? It's Ooh. all of them. <laughs> it's all encompassing. It's everything you could ever imagine in a semi-personal launch monitor. <laughs> but Tony.